The Radio Memories Network is brought to you in part by Liberated Syndication, podcast publishing made easy, Libsyn.com. That's L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. Experiencing the plays, great performances, and compelling stories each week from the archives of great productions of Hollywood's best producers and actors. We now go back to the early days of radio and our imaginations with our featured drama presentation. Of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste Slow down, I can't keep up. Brought death into the world and all her woe with loss of Eden. Till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat. Poor sick old fool dragged up from the gene pool by the almighty. Blighted by the fact that he can't see the liver spots on the back of his own hand. Never mind his manuscript. Twice widowed and blind, this poor old fool comes from the school that holds all the world's ills were somebody's fault. In essence, mine. So he unlocks the vault marked Dawn of Time. Sing heavenly muse. On the secret top of Oreb or of Sinai, it's inspired that shepherd. Ah, he yes. He thinks, poor sop, this epic comes to him in sleep. Rose. Delivered by a muse he calls Urania, but I call her despair. A mania brought on by grief and his unshakable belief in the goodness of his lord. Fast by the oracle of God, I thence invoke thy aid to my adventurous song that with no middle flight intends to soar above the Aeonian mount while it pursues... Tell your muse to slow it down. I need more ink. This song pursues things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme. Yes, rhyme. Except that he disdains such sounds, calls them mere jingling, like the chains that bind him to his suffering. Oh, give me strength. He tells my story with a tenth of the injustice I endured. Book the first begins in Hell's Flame Lake. Of all the liberties to take, this was the worst. Oh, that to the height of this great argument I may assert eternal providence and justify the ways of God to man. Beelzebub. Beelzebub. If thou beest he, but oh, how fallen, how changed from him who in the happy realms of light clothed with transcendent brightness didst outshine myriads though bright. <laughs> Satan, oh, prince, oh, chief of many throned powers that led the embattled seraphim to war under thy conduct and in dreadful deeds fearless endangered heaven's perpetual king. If he who mutual league united thoughts and counsels equal hope and hazard in the glorious enterprise joined with me once now misery hath joined in equal ruin too well i see and rue the dire event that with sad overthrow and foul defeat hath lost us heaven and all this mighty host in horrible destruction laid thus low so spake the apostate angels, though in pain, vaunting aloud, but racked with deep despair. Into what pit thou seest? From what height, fool? In the almighty power hurled, headlong flaming from the ethereal sky, with hideous ruin and combustion down. And till then, who knew the force of those dire arms? To bottomless perdition, there to dwell in adamantine chains and penal fire, who durst defy the omnipotent to arms. Nine times the space that measures day and night to mortal men, he with his horrid crew lay vanquished. 
rolling in the fiery gulf, confounded though immortal. Oh, how unlike the place from whence they fell. Farewell, happy fields, where joy forever dwells. Hail, horrors, hail, infernal worlds. The mind is its own place, and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. What matter where, if I be still the same, and what I should be, all but less than he whom thunder hath made greater? Here, at least, we shall be free. The Almighty hath not built here, for his envy will not drive us hence. Here we may reign secure, and in my choice to reign is worth ambition, though in hell. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. So stretched out huge in length, the arch fiend lay chained on the burning lake, nor ever thence had risen or heaved his head, but that the will and high permission of all ruling heaven left him at large to his own dark designs. Yes, yes, left him at large to his own dark designs that with reiterated crimes he might heap on himself damnation while he sought evil to others and, enraged, might see how all his malice served but to bring forth infinite goodness, grace, and mercy shown on man, by him seduced, but on himself, treble, confusion, wrath, and vengeance poured. Seest thou yon dreary plain, forlorn and wild, the seat of desolation, void of light, save what the glimmering of these livid flames cast pale and dreadful. Thither let us tend, from off the tossing of these fiery waves, there rest, if any rest can harbour there, and reassembling our afflicted powers, consult how we may henceforth most offend our enemy. Our own loss, how repair, how overcome this dire calamity, what reinforcement we may gain from hope, if not what resolution from despair. Forthwith, upright, he rears from off the pool his mighty stature. On each hand the flames, driven backward, slope their pointing spires, and rolled in billows leave in the midst a horrid veil. Then with expanded wings, he steers his flight aloft, incumbent on the dusky air that felt unusual weight, till on dry land he lights. Then on the beach of that inflamed sea he stood and called his legions, he called so loud that all the hollow deep of hell resounded. And to their general's voice they soon obeyed in humor. of immortal spirits, O oh, powers of matchless, but with the Almighty, and that strife was not inglorious, though the event was dire, as this place testifies, and this dire change hateful to utter. But the power of mind, foreseeing or presaging from the depths of knowledge, past or present, could have feared how such united force of gods how such as stood like these could ever know repulse. For who can yet believe, though after loss, that all these puissant legions, whose exile hath emptied heaven, shall fail to reascend, self-raised, and repossess their native seat? <laughs> For me, be witness all the host of heaven, if counsels different or danger shunned by me have lost our hopes. But he who reigns monarch in heaven, till then as one secure sat on his throne, upheld by old repute, consent or custom, and his regal state put forth at full, but still his strength concealed, which tempted our attempt and wrought our fall. Henceforth, his might we know, and know our own, so as not either to provoke or dread new war provoked. 
Our better part remains to work in close design by fraud or guile, what force effected not, that he, no less at length from us may find, who overcomes by force, hath overcome but half his foe. Space may produce new worlds, whereof so rife there went a fame in heaven that he, ere long, intended to create and therein plant a generation whom his choice regard should favour equal to the sons of heaven. Thither, if but to pry, shall be perhaps our first eruption. Thither or elsewhere. For this infernal pit shall never hold celestial spirits in bondage, nor the abyss long under darkness cover. But these thoughts, full counsel must mature. Peace is despaired, for who can think submission? War then war! And in response, these devils fashioned him a palace? Elizabeth, amanuensis, wife, but not interrogator, please. I am trying to keep pace. Built like a temple where pilasters round were set and Doric pillars overlaid with golden architrave. Nor did there want cornice or frieze with bosses, sculptures, graven. A palace, yes. I thought you said a palace. Elizabeth, the roof was fretted gold. The ascending pile stood fixed her stately height. And straight the doors opening their brazen folds discover wide within her ample spaces. From the arched roof, pendant by subtle magic, Many a row of starry lamps and blazing crescents, fed with naphtha and asphaltus, yielded light as from a sky, as from a sky, as from... Is that today all done? No. You look so weary, John. There was more. The muse gave me more. Tomorrow? Please, Elizabeth. You need to name this palace. I do not. It has a name. Go on. And so the winged heralds, by command of sovereign power, with awful ceremony and trumpet sound throughout the host, proclaim a solemn council, forthwith to be held at Pandemonium, the high capital of Satan and his peers. Their summons called from every band and squared regiment by space or choice the worthiest. They are known with hundreds and with thousands trooping came. That woman is a greater saint than ever he. Without complaint, his epic rant, apologist for tyranny, his discrediting of me, his victor's view of history, is spat out at the table, and she writes it down, unable to rest until the muse has gobbed her last, and I am robbed. Book the second, yes? Which begins... In Pandemonium Palace. The great seraphic lords and cherubim in close recess and secret conclave sat. A thousand demigods on golden seats, frequent and full. After short silence then, and summons read, the great consult began. Slow down. Where there is then no good for which to strive, no strife can grow up there from faction. For none shall would claim in hell precedence, none whose portion is so small of present pain that with ambitious mind will covet more. With this advantage then to union and firm faith, firm accord, more than can be in heaven, we now return. We now return to claim our just inheritance of all. Yes! Surer to prosper than prosperity could have assured us. And by what best way, whether of open war or covert guile, we now debate. Who can advise may speak. Moloch. My sentence is for open war. Yeah. 
Millions that stand in arms and longing wait the signal to ascend. Six lingering here, heaven's fugitives. And for their dwelling place, accept this dark, opprobrious den of shame. The prison of his tyranny, who reigns by our delay? No! Let us rather choose. Armed with hell flames and fury all at once, or heaven's high towers to force resistless way. Turning our tortures into horrid arms against the torturer! On the other side uprose Belial, in act more graceful and humane. A fairer person lost not heaven. He seemed for dignity composed and high exploit. I should be much for open war, O peers, as not for hiding hate. If what was urged, main reason to persuade immediate war, did not dissuade me most, and seek to cast ominous conjecture on the whole success. Whatever doing, what can we suffer more? What can we suffer worse? Is this then worse? Thus sitting, thus consulting, thus in arms? What when we fled amain, pursued and struck with heaven's afflicting thunder, and besought the deep to shelter us. This hell then seemed a refuge from those wounds. Or when we lay chained on the burning lake, that sure was worse. What if the breath that kindled those grim fires awake should blow them into sevenfold rage and plunge us in the flames while we perhaps designing or exhorting glorious war caught in a fiery tempest shall be hurled each on his rock transfixed the sport and prey of racking whirlwinds or forever sunk under yon boiling ocean wrapped in chains there to converse with everlasting groans unrespited unpitied unreprieved ages of hopeless end this would be worse. War, therefore, open or concealed alike, my voice dissuades. Thus Belial, with words clothed in reason's garb, counseled ignoble ease and peaceful sloth, not peace. And after him, thus Mammon spake. Let us seek our own good from ourselves, Aye. and from our own, live to ourselves. Mm. Cannot we his light imitate when we please? This desert soil wants not her hidden luster, gems and gold, nor want we skill or art from whence to raise magnificence. And what can heaven show more? Our torments also may in length of time become our elements. These piercing fires as soft as now severe, our temper changed into their temper, which must needs remove the sensible of pain. All things invite to peaceful councils, and the settled state of order, how in safety best we may compose our present evils with regard of what we are and were, dismissing quite all thoughts of war, ye have what I advise. Such applause was heard as Mammon ended, and his sentence pleased advising peace. For such another field they dreaded worse than hell. So much the fear of thunder and the sword of Michael wrought still within them, and no less desire to found this nether empire which might rise by policy and long process of time in emulation opposite to heaven. Which when Beelzebub perceived, than whom Satan except none higher sat, with grave aspect he rose, and in his rising seemed a pillar of state, deep on his front engraven deliberation sat, and public care, and princely counsel in his face yet shone majestic, though in ruin. Sage he stood with Atlantean shoulders fit to bear the weight of mightiest monarchies. His look drew audience and attention, <laughs> Still as night, or summer's noontide air. Ah, thus 
He spoke. Audience and attention. Yeah. I've lost my thread again, John. Drew audience and attention still as night or summer's noontide air, while thus he spake. So Beelzebub is going to stand against war? And peace, yes. He stands against war and peace? He counsels pure revenge, so deep a malice to confound the race of mankind in one root, and earth with hell to mingle and involve, down all to spite the great creator. Another world, the happy seat of some new race called man. About this time to be created, like to us, though less in power and excellence, but favoured more of him who rules above. Humanity. A blight. With neither cause nor purpose. For which the only cure is right redress. This place may lie exposed the utmost border of his kingdom, left to their defence who hold it. Here, perhaps, some advantageous act may be achieved by sudden onset, either hellfire to waste his whole creation or possess all as our own and drive as we were driven, the puny habitants, or, if not drive, Seduce them to our party, that their god may prove their foe, and with repenting hand abolish his own works. This would surpass common revenge, and interrupt his joy in our confusion, and our joy upraise in his disturbance when his darling sons, hurled headlong to partake with us, shall curse their frail originals and faded bliss. Faded so soon. Advise if this be worth attempting, or to sit in darkness here, hatching vain empires. Ah, Beelzebub. Most loyal and subtle right-hand man. Very well. But first, whom shall we send in search of this new world? Whom shall we find sufficient? Who else would you send? And so the adversary of God and man, Satan, with thoughts inflamed of highest design, puts on swift wings and toward the gates of hell explores his solitary flight. At last appear hell bounds, high reaching to the horrid roof, and thrice threefold the gates, three folds were brass, three iron, three of adamantine rock, impenetrable, impaled with circling fire, yet unconsumed. Before the gates there sat on either side, a formidable shape. The one seemed woman to the waist and fair, but ended foul in many a scaly fold, voluminous and vast, a serpent armed with mortal sting. About her middle round, the cry of hell hands, never ceasing, barked with wide Siberian mouths, full loud and rung a hideous peal. Yet when they list, would creak or disturb their noise into her womb and kennel there. Yet there still barked and howled within, unseen. The other shape, if shape it might be called, the shape had none distinguishable in member joint or limb, or substance might be called that shadow seemed, for each seemed either black it stood as night, Fierce as ten furies, terrible as hell, and shook a dreadful dart. What seemed his head the likeness of a kingly crown had on. Who are these disgusting creatures? From where in your soul did you conjure them? She is called Sin, he is called Death. They are Satan's son and daughter, now guardians of the gates of hell. Is this what your muse brings you in the dead of night? Demonic sibling monsters? No, not siblings. Or not only. Sin is Death's mother. Also, Satan raped his only daughter. 
and from her womb was born this son. You, you must have a fever, John, or a madness of some sort. I give these lines as they are given to me. How can you live with these thoughts? How will I forget them? We should not forget, even if Satan can barely recall the fruits of his own foul deeds. Hast thou forgot me, then? And do I seem now in thine eyes so foul, once deemed so fair? I pleased, and with attractive graces won the most averse, thee chiefly who full oft thyself in me thy perfect image viewing becamest enamoured. And such joy thou tookst with me in secret, that my womb conceived a growing burden. Dear daughter, since thou claimst me for thy sire, and my fair son here showest me, the dear pledge of dalliance had with thee in heaven and joys, then sweet, now sad, to mention through dire change befallen us unforeseen, unthought of. No, I come no enemy, but to set free from out this dark and dismal house of pain both him and thee, and all the heavenly host of spirits that in our just pretenses armed fell with us from on high. Thou art my father. Thou my author, thou my being gavest me. Whom should I obey but thee? Whom follow? Thou wilt bring me soon to that new world of light and bliss among the gods who live at ease, where I shall reign at thy right hand, voluptuous, as beseems thy daughter and thy darling without end. Thus saying, from her side the fatal key, sad instrument of all our woe, she took. So Satan, with less toil and now with ease, wafts on the calmer wave by a dubious light, and like a weather-beaten vessel holds gladly the port, Though shrouds and tackle torn, or in the emptier west, resembling air, waves his spread wings at leisure to behold, far off, the imperial, extended wide in circuit, undetermined square or round, with opal towers and battlements adorned of living sapphire, once his native seat, and pass by, Hanging in a golden chain, this pendant world, in bigness as a star of smallest magnitude close by the moon. Thither, full fraught with mischievous revenge, accursed, and in a cursed hour, he hies. And so, to my torment, I ascended to the world of light. Hail, holy light, offspring of heaven firstborn, or of the eternal, co-eternal beam. May I express thee, unblamed, since God is light, and never but in unapproached light dwelt from eternity, dwelt then in thee, bright effluence of bright essence, in create. John, is that enough for one day? My heart is tired. It's too much, all this... Wickedness. There is more to be done. I have more lines. My eyes are tired. Your eyes. I know, I know. O oh Lord, thou revisitest not these eyes that roll in vain to find thy piercing ray and find no dawn. So thick a drop serene hath quenched their orbs or dim suffusion veiled. You poor blind fool. It's such a sorry tale. Yet from your dark you conjure more light than my eyes can bear. It scars me. Now had the Almighty Father from above bent down his eye, his own works and their works at once to view. On earth he first beheld our two first parents, yet the only two of mankind, in the happy garden placed reaping immortal fruits of joy and love, uninterrupted joy, unrivaled love in blissful solitude. He then surveyed hell and the gulf between, and Satan there, coasting the wall of heaven on this side night in the dun air sublime, and ready now to stoop with wearied wings and willing feet on the bare outside of this world, 
And so the Almighty Father speaks. Only begotten Son. Yes, Father. Seest thou what rage transports our adversary directly towards the new created world? Look. I do. Towards that new created world and man there placed with purpose to assay if him by force he can destroy or worse by some false guile pervert and shall pervert for man will hearken to his glozing lies and easily transgress the sole command, sole pledge of his obedience so will fall he and his faithless progeny. Whose fault? Whose but his own? Ingrate, he had of me all he could have. I made him just and right, sufficient to have stood, though free to fall. Oh, woeful, pitiful humanity. Behold me, then. Me for him, life for life I offer. On me let thine anger fall. Account me man. I for his sake will leave thy bosom, and this glory next to thee freely put off, and for him lastly die. Well pleased, on me let death wreck all his rage. Under his gloomy power I shall not long lie vanquished. Thou hast given me to possess life in myself for ever. By thee I live, though now to death I yield, and am his due, all that of me can die, yet that debt paid. Thou wilt not leave me in the lonesome grave his prey, nor suffer my unspotted soul forever with corruption there to dwell. But I shall rise victorious and subdue my vanquisher, spoiled of his vaunted spoil. Death, his death's wound, shall then receive and stoop in glorious of his mortal sting disarmed. The multitude of angels with a shout loud as from numbers without number, sweet as from blessed voices, uttering joy, heaven rung with jubilee and loud hosannas filled the eternal regions, lowly, reverent towards the two they by. To the ground with solemn adoration down they cast their crowns inwove with amaranth and gold. Meanwhile, upon the thermopacous globe of this round world, whose first convex divides the luminous inferior orbs, enclosed from chaos and the inroad of darkness old, Satan alighted. Walks. That spot to which I point is paradise, Adam's abode, those lofty shades his bower. Here, John, is your bread. Yes. And here, your bowl. Thank you. It's hot. Mm -hmm. Be careful. It is time to enter the garden. It's midwinter, John. Hmm? The garden's like a stone. <laughs> the garden, paradise. It's time for this poem to go there. Urania began to conjure it for me last night while I was sleeping. Your muse is nothing if not busy. The call is urgent. Our world falls in upon itself. These words I take as gifts from her give shape to what we've lost. There is so much to explain. Farewell, remorse. All good to me is lost. Evil be thou, my good. By thee at least, divided empire with heaven's king I hold. By thee, and more than half perhaps will reign. As man ere long, and this new world shall know. One gate there only was, and that looked east on the other side, which when the arch fell and saw due entrance, heat is dead, and in contempt, at one slight bound, high overleaped all bound of hill or highest wall, and sheer within lights on his feet. 
as when a prowling wolf, whom hunger drives to seek new haunt for prey, watching where shepherds pen their flocks at eve in hurdled cots, amid the fields secure, leaps o'er the fence with ease into the fold. Thence up he flew, and on the tree of life, the middle tree and highest there that grew, sat like a cormorant, yet not true life thereby regained, but sat devising death to those who lived. And from my lofty vantage point I saw a happy rural seat of various view, groves whose rich trees wept odorous gums and balm, others whose fruit burnished with golden rind hung amiable, Hesperian fables true, if true here only, and of delicious taste, betwixt them lawns or level downs and flocks grazing the tender herb, were interposed. And then the fiend set eyes upon two of far nobler shape, erect and tall, godlike erect, with native honour clad, in naked majesty seemed lords of all, and worthy seemed, for in their looks divine the image of their glorious maker shone, truth, wisdom, sanctitude, severe and pure. His fair, large front and eye sublime declared absolute rule, and hyacinthine locks round from his parted forelock manly hung, clustering, but not beneath his shoulders broad. She, as a veil down to the slender waist, her unadorned golden tresses wore, dishevelled, but in wanton ringlets waved as the vine curls her tendrils, which implied subjection, but required with gentle sway, and by her yielded, by him best received, yielded with coy submission, modest pride, and sweet, reluctant, amorous delay. Nor those mysterious parts were then concealed. Then was not guilty shame, dishonest shame of nature's works, honour dishonourable, sin bred. How have ye troubled all mankind with shows instead, mere shows of seeming pure, and banished from man's life his happiest life? Simplicity and spotless innocence surpassed they naked on, nor shunned the sight of God or angel, for they thought no ill. So hand in hand they passed, the loveliest pair that ever since in love's embraces met. Adam, the goodliest man of men since born, his sons, the fairest of her daughters, Eve. Under a tuft of shade that on a green stood whispering soft, by a fresh fountain side they sat them down, and to their supper fruits they fell, <laughs> nectarine fruits, which the compliant boughs yielded them, sidelong as they sat reclined on the soft downy bank, damasked with flowers. The savoury pulp they chew, and in the rind, still as they thirsted, scoop the brimming stream nor gentle purpose, nor endearing smiles wanted, nor youthful dalliance as beseems fair couple, linked in happy nuptial league, alone as they. About them frisking played all beasts of the earth, since wild, and of all chase in wood or wilderness, forest or den, sporting the lion ramped, and in his poor dandle the kid Bears, tigers, answers, pards gambled before them. The unwieldy elephant, to make them mirth, used all his might and wreathed his lithe proboscis. Close the serpent sly insinuating, wove with Gordian twine his braided train, and of his fatal guile gave proof unheeded. Others on the grass cap and now filled with gazing sat all bedward ruminating, for the sun declined was hasting now with prone career to the ocean isles, and in the ascending scale of heaven the stars that usher evening rose, when Satan, still in gaze, as first he stood, scarce thus at length failed speech recovered sad. O oh, hell, what do mine eyes with Behold, 
into our room of bliss, thus high advanced. Ah, gentle pair. Ye little think how nigh your change approaches, when all these delights will vanish and deliver ye to woe. More woe, the more your taste is now of joy. Happy, but for so happy, ill-secured long to continue, and this high seat your heaven, ill-fenced for heaven to keep out such a foe as now is entered. <laughs> then from his lofty stand on that high tree, down he alights among the sportful herd of those four-footed kinds, himself now one, now other, as their shape served best his end, nearer to view his prey, and, unespied, to mark what of their state he more might learn by word or action marked. About them round a lion now he stalks with fiery glare, then as a tiger, who by chance hath spied by some purlieu, two gentle fawns at play, straight couches close, then, rising, changes oft his couch and watch, as one who chose his ground, whence rushing, he might surest seize them both, gripped in each paw. When Adam first of men to first of women Eve, thus moving speech, turned him all ear, to hear new utterance flow. Sole partner, and sole part of all these joys, dearer thyself than all. Needs must the power that made us, and for us this ample world, be infinitely good, and of his good as liberal and free as infinite, that raised us from the dust, and placed us here in all this happiness, who at his hand have nothing merited, nor can perform, aught whereof he hath need, he who requires from us no other service than to keep this one this easy charge of all the trees in paradise that bear delicious fruits so various not to taste that only tree of knowledge planted by the tree of life so let us ever praise god and extol his bounty following our delightful task to prune these growing plants and tend these flowers which were it toilsome yet with thee were sweet to whom thus eve replied O oh, thou for whom and from whom i was formed flesh of thy flesh and without whom am to no end. My guide and head, what thou hast said is just and right, for we to him indeed all praises owe, and daily thanks. I chiefly, who enjoy so far the happier lot, enjoying thee, preeminent by so much odds, while thou, like consort to thyself, canst nowhere find. So spake our general mother, and with eyes of conjugal attraction unreproved, and meek surrender, half embracing, leaned on our first father. Half her swelling breast naked met his, under the flowing gold of her loose tresses hid. He in delight both of her beauty and submissive charms, smiled with superior love as Jupiter on Juno smiles, when he imprains the clouds that shed May flowers, and pressed her matron lip with kisses pure. Sight hateful, sight tormenting. Thus these two, imparadised in one another's arms, the happier Eden shall enjoy their fill of bliss on bliss, while I to hell am thrust, where neither joy nor love but fierce desire, among our other torments not the least, still unfulfilled with pain of longing pines. Yet let me not forget what I have gained from their own mouths. All is not theirs, it seems, one fatal tree there stands of knowledge called, forbidden them to taste. Knowledge forbidden, suspicious, reasonless. Why should their lord envy them that? Can it be sin to know? Can it be death? And do they only stand by ignorance? Is that their happy state, a proof of their obedience and their faith? O oh, fair foundation laid, whereon to build their ruin. Hand in hand alone, they passed on to their blissful bower. It was a place chosen by the sovereign planter when he framed all things to man's delightful use. The roof of thickest covert was in woven shade laurel and myrtle, and what higher grew of firm and fragrant leaf. On either side, acanthus and each odorous bushy shrub fenced up the verdant wall. Each beauteous flower, iris, all hues, roses and jessamine, 
reared high their flourished heads between, and wrought mosaic. Underfoot the violet, crocus and hyacinth, with rich inlay broidered the ground, more coloured than with stone of costliest emblem. Other creature here, beast, bird, insect, or worm, durst enter none. Such was their awe of man. Thus at their shady lodge arrived, both stood, both turned, and under open sky adored the God that made both sky, air, earth, and heaven, which they beheld. The moon's resplendent globe and a starry pole, thou also madest the night, maker omnipotent, and thou the day, which we in our appointed work employed, have finished happy in our mutual help and mutual love, the crown of all our bliss ordained by thee, and this delicious place for us too large, where thy abundance wants partakers and uncropped falls to the ground. But thou hast promised from us to a race to fill the earth, who shall with us extol thy goodness infinite, both when we wake and when we seek, as now thy gift of sleep. Amen. John. Hmm? I know. Sorry. Was, um... A toad. Yes, yes, that's right. You were saying that Satan took the form of a toad and then you fell asleep. A toad, yes. To whisper in our mother's sleeping ear notions of sedition and despair. Your amanuensis craves her sleep now, John. Like your Eve. Well, yes, of course. Oh, oh, apologies, Elizabeth. Does it trouble you to leave our ancient mother prey to the persuasion of a devil? No, it's late. Let us sleep. Our mother is safe in the care of that great guardian, Gabriel, and his angels. When he catches that foul toad, there will be hell indeed to pay. Caught in the act. Caught croaking rebel songs into the ear of that silly, ribborn woman. Caught, chained, hauled before the errand boy, friend Gabriel, on another mission sent to Earth from Heaven to clean up my act after the fact. Fool. Why hast thou, Satan, broke the bounds prescribed to thy transgressions and disturbed the charge of others? who will prove not to transgress by thy example, would have power and right to question thy bold entrance on this place, employed, it seems, to violate sleep and those whose dwelling God hath planted here in bliss. Gabriel, thou hadst in heaven the esteem of wise, and such I held thee, but this question asked puts me in doubt. Lives there who loves his pain? Who would not, finding way, break loose from hell, though thither doomed? Thou wouldst thyself, no doubt, and boldly venture to whatever place farthest from from pain, where thou mightst hope to change torment with ease, and soonest recompense dull with delight, which in this place I sought. <laughs> the rest is true. They found me where they say. But that implies not violence or harm. <laughs> Fly thither whence thou fledst, if from this hour within these hallowed limits thou appear. Back to the infernal pit I drag thee chained, and seal thee so as henceforth not to scorn the fossil gates of hell too slightly barred. The fiend looked up and fled, murmuring, and with him fled the shades of night. The fiend looked up and fled. If that is how it looks to you, let that ring true in your prim ears, but let me tell you, all your fears are my desires. Instead of he looked up and fled, read he retires, he rests his weary head, he weighs up his next move to shatter this their bower blessed, all too trusting so-called love. Oh. Awake, mm. my fairest, my espoused, mm. my latest found, heaven's last best gift, my ever new delight. Awake, oh. the morning shines. Oh, oh. And meanwhile, in her bower, Eve awakes, unsettled by the dream I seeded in her, starring me, all set beneath the legendary tree, a dry run for what I planned to do to her. Glad.
glad I see thy face, and morn returned. For I this night, such night till this, I never passed, have dreamed, if dreamed, not as I often won't, of thee, works of day past, or morrow's next design, but of offence and trouble, which my mind knew never till this irksome night. Methought, close at mine ear, one called me forth to walk, with gentle voice, I thought it thine. It said, Why sleepst thou, Eve? Now is the pleasant time, the cool, the silent. Save where silence yields to the night warbling bird that now wake tunes sweetest his love laboured song. Now reigns full orb the moon, and with more pleasing light shadowy sets off the face of things. In vain, if none regard, heaven wakes with all his eyes, whom to behold but thee, nature's desire, in whose sight all things joy with ravishment, attracted by thy beauty, still to gaze. I rose, as at thy call, but found thee not. To find thee, I directed then my walk, and on me thought, alone I passed through ways that brought me on a sudden to the tree of interdicted knowledge. Fair, it seemed much fairer to my fancy than by day, and as I wondering looked, beside it stood one shaped and winged like one of those from heaven by us oft seen, his dewy locks distilled ambrosia. On that tree he also gazed, and, O oh, fair plant, said he, With fruits surcharged, deigns none to ease thy load and taste thy sweet, nor God, nor man. Is knowledge so despised, or envy or what reserve forbids to taste? Forbid who will, None shall from me withhold longer thy offered good. Why else set here? This said, he paused not, but with venturous arm he plucked, he tasted. Me, damp horror, chilled at such bold words, vouched with a deed so bold. But he thus overjoyed. Oh! Fruit divine, sweet of thyself, but much more sweet thus cropped. Taste this, and be henceforth among the gods, thyself a goddess, not to earth confined, but sometimes in the air, as we sometimes ascend to heaven by merit thine, and see what life the gods live there, and such live thou. So saying, he drew nigh, and to me held, even to my mouth of that same fruit held part which he had plucked, the pleasant, savoury smell, so quickened appetite, that me thought could not but taste. Forthwith, up to the clouds with him I flew, and underneath beheld the earth outstretched, immense, prospect wide and various, wondering at my flight and change to this high exultation. Suddenly my guide was gone, and I, methought, sunk down and fell asleep. Oh, oh how glad I wake to find this but a dream. Best image of myself and dearer half, <laughs> the trouble of thy thoughts this night in sleep affects me equally, <laughs> nor can I like this uncouth dream. Of evil sprung, I fear. What intellect, what powers? Evil into the mind of God or man may come and go so unapproved and leave no spot or blame behind, which gives me hope that what in sleep thou didst abhor to dream, waking, thou never wilt consent to do. What foolish, all-consuming trust. <laughs> so cheered he his fair spouse, and she was cheered. <laughs> But silently a gentle tear let fall from either eye and wiped them with her hair. Be not disheartened, then. Nor cloud those looks that won't be more cheerful and serene than when fair morning first smiles on the world. And let us to our fresh employments rise. Among the groves, the fountains and the flowers that open now their choicest bosomed smells reserved from night and kept for thee in store. Unto their morning's rural work they haste among sweet dews and flowers, where any row of fruit trees over woody reach too far their pampered boughs, and needed hands to check fruitless embraces, 
or they led the vine to wed her elm. She spoused about him twines her marriageable arms, and with her brings her dower the adopted clusters to adorn his barren leaves. Them thus employed, beheld with pity heaven's high king, and to him called Raphael, the sociable spirit. Good Raphael, said he, thou hearst what stir on earth Satan from hell, scaped through the darksome gulf hath raised in paradise. Mm. And how disturbed this night the human pair, how he designs in them at once to ruin all mankind. I do, my lord. Go, therefore, half this day, as friend with friend, converse with Adam, in what bound or shade thou find'st him from the heat of noon retired. Tell him with all his danger, and from whom. What enemy late fallen himself from heaven is plotting now the fall of others from like state of bliss? By violence, no, for that shall be withstood, but by deceit and lies. This let him know, lest willfully transgressing he pretend surprise, unadmonished, unforewarned. It will be done, Lord. Like I said, the errand boy. Thank you, my dear. I'm replete. It was only bread and broth, John. A banquet. Uh, so, Raphael descended to the earth, to the garden, mm -hmm. to eat with our first parents and to warn them of the dangers they must face. Temptation, guile, subterfuge, the multiple masks of evil. Oh, favorable spirit, propitious guest, well hast thou taught the way that might direct our knowledge, <laughs> and the scale of nature set from center to circumference, whereon in contemplation of created things, by steps, we may ascend to God. That thou art happy, O to God, that thou continue such, O to thyself, that is, to thy obedience therein stand. This was thy caution given thee, he advised. God made thee perfect, not immutable, and good he made thee, but to persevere he left it in thy power, ordained thy will by nature free, not overruled by fate inextricable or strict necessity. Our voluntary service he requires, not our necessitated. Such with him finds no acceptance, nor can find, for how can hearts not free be tried whether they serve willing or no, who will but what they must by destiny and can no other choose? Myself and all the angelic host that stand in sight of God enthroned, our happy state hold as you yours, while our obedience holds. On other surety, none. Freely we serve because we freely love, as in our will to love or not. In this we stand or fall. And some are fallen to disobedience fallen. And so from heaven to deepest hell. O oh, fall from what high state of bliss into what woe. Divine instructor, what thou tell'st hath passed in heaven, some doubt within me move, but more desire to hear if thou consent, the full relation which must needs be strange. Poor sweet Adam. Aghast at the idea that angels might choose to disobey and fall. And you, old fool, find such impoverished imagination admirable. So Raphael consents to try to tell how angels turned to devils. His tale begins with all the company of heaven gathered to the throne of the almighty God. This day I have begot whom I declare my only son, and on this holy hill him have anointed, whom ye now behold at my right hand. Your head I him appoint, kingship and royal succession, and by myself have sworn to him shall bow all knees in heaven and shall confess him Lord. Under his great vicegerent reign abide, united as one individual soul, forever happy. Him who disobeys, me disobeys, breaks union, and that day cast out from God, and blessed vision falls into utter darkness, deep engulfed, his place Ordained without redemption, without end. So spake the Omnipotent, and with his words all seemed well pleased. All seemed, but were not all. That day, as other solemn days, they spent in song and dance about the sacred hill. Forthwith from dance to sweet repast they turned, desirous, all in circles as they stood. 
Tables are set and on a sudden piled with angels' food and ruby nectar flows. Now when ambrosial night with clouds exhaled and roseate dews disposed all but the unsleeping eyes of God to rest, by living streams among the trees of life, pavilions numberless and sudden reared celestial tabernacles where they slept, fanned with cool winds, save those who in their course melodious hymns about the sovereign throne alternate all night long. But not so wait Satan, so call him now, his former name is heard no more in heaven. He of the first, if not the first archangel, great in power, in favour and preeminence, yet fraught with envy against the Son of God that day, honoured by his great father and proclaimed Messiah, King anointed, could not bear through pride that sight and thought himself impurred. Deep malice thence conceiving and disdain, soon as midnight brought on the dusky hour, friendliest to sleep and silence, he resolved with all his legions to dislodge and leave unworshipped, unobeyed, the throne supreme contemptuous. And his next subordinate awakening, thus to him in secret spake, Assemble thou of all those myriads which we lead the chief. Tell them that by command, ere yet dim night her shadowy cloud withdraws, I am to haste, and all who under me their banners wave, homeward with flying march where we possess the quarters of the north, there to prepare fit entertainment to receive our king, the great messiah, and his new commands, who speedily through all the hierarchies intends to pass triumphant and give laws. So spake the false archangel and infused bad influence into the unwary breast of his associate. He together calls, or several, one by one, the regent powers, under him regent. May we refill your cup? You may. Meanwhile, the eternal eye, whose sight discerns abstrusest thoughts from forth his holy mount and from within the golden lamps that burn nightly before him, saw without their light rebellion rising. Saw in whom, how spread among the sons of morn, what multitudes were banded to oppose his high decree. And smiling to his only son, thus said, Son, thou, thou in whom my glory I behold in full resplendence, heir of all my might, such a foe is rising who intends to erect his throne equal to ours throughout the spacious north nor so content hath in his thought to try in battle what our power is or our right. Let us advise, and to this hazard draw with speed what force is left, and all employ in our defence, lest unawares we lose this our high place, our sanctuary, our hill. Mighty Father, Thou thy foes justly has in derision, and secure laughs at their vain designs and tumults vain. Matter to me of glory, whom their hate illustrates when they see all regal power given me to quell their pride, and in event know whether I be dexterous to subdue thy rebels, or be found the worst in heaven. Now storming fury rose, and clamour such as heard in heaven till now was never. Arms on armour, clashing, brayed, horrible discord, and the madding wheels of brazen chariots raged. Dire was the noise of conflict. Overhead the dismal hiss of fiery darts in flaming volleys flew, and flying vaulted either host with fire. So under fiery cope together rushed both battles main, with ruinous assault and inextinguishable rage. All heaven resounded, and had earth been then, all earth had to her centre shock. What wonder, when millions of fierce encountering angels fought on either side, the least of whom could wield these elements and arm him with the force of all their regions? Until Satan came face to face. Until I came face to face, shield to shield, blade to blade, breath to breath, with the adversary I hoped I'd never meet. The mighty. Archangel Michael. They waved their fiery swords, and in the air made horrid circles. Two broad suns, their shields blazed opposite, while expectation stood in horror. 
together both with next to almighty arm. Uplifted, imminent, one stroke they aimed that might determine and not need repeat, as not of power at once, nor odds appeared in might or swift prevention. But the sword of Michael from the armory of God was given him tempered so that neither keen nor solid might resist that edge. It met the sword of Satan with steep force to smite descending, and in half cut sheer, nor stayed but with swift wheel reverse, deep entering shard all his right side. Then Satan first knew pain and writhed him to and fro convolved, so saw the griding sword with discontinuous wound pass through him. But the ethereal substance closed, not long divisible, and from the gash, a stream of nectarous humour issuing flowed sanguine, such as celestial spirits may bleed. And all his armour stained, erewhile so bright. Forthwith on all sides to his aid was run by angels, many and strong, who interposed defence, while others bore him on their shields back to his chariot, where it stood retired from off the files of war. There they him laid, gnashing for anguish and despite and shame, to find himself not matchless, and his pride humbled by such rebuke so far beneath his confidence to equal God in power. Yet soon I healed, for spirits that live throughout vital in every part, not as frail man in entrails, heart or head, liver or reins, cannot but by annihilating die. Now night her course began, and over heaven inducing darkness, grateful truce imposed, and silence on the odious din of war. Not quite silence, not quite truce. My armies were discovering new alchemies. In a moment, up they turned wide the celestial soil, and saw beneath the originals of nature in their crude conception, sulphurous and nitrous foam they found. They mingled, and with subtle art, concocted and adusted, they reduced to blackest grain, and into store conveyed. Part hidden veins digged up, nor had this earth entrails unlike of mineral and stone, whereof to found their engines and their balls of missive ruin. Part incentive reed provide, pernicious with one touch to fire. From those deep throated engines belched, whose roar emboweled with outrageous noise the air, and all her entrails tore, disgorging foul their devilish glut changed. Thunderbolts and hail of iron globes, which on the victor host levelled with such impetuous fury smote, that whom they hit, none on their feet might stand, though standing else as rocks. But down they fell by thousands, angel on archangel rolled. Stop, stop, John. I cannot keep pace. Ah, yes. I'm sorry. This battle sweeps you up in it. The words too many and too swift. You rest your hand a while. I'll try to hold the next lines in my head while you recover. <sighs> Go on. But slowly. Yes. War seemed a civil game to this uproar. Horrid confusion. Heaped upon confusion rose. And now all heaven had gone to wreck. With ruin overspread, had not the Almighty Father, where he sits, shrined in his sanctuary of heaven secure, consulting on the summer things, foreseen this tumult, and permitted all that his great purpose he might so fulfill, to honor his anointed son avenged upon his enemies, and to declare all power on him transferred, whence to his son, the assessor of his throne, he thus began. Son beloved, two days are past. Father, two days of what? Two days as we compute the days of heaven since Michael and his powers went forth to tame these disobedient. Ah, yes. Saw hath been their fight, as likely as was, when two such foes met armed. For to themselves I left them, and thou knowst, equal in their creation they were formed, save what sin hath impaired, which yet hath wrought insensibly. For I suspend their doom, 
Whence in perpetual fight they needs must last endless, and no solution will be found. War, wearied war, hath performed what war can do, and to disordered rage let loose the reins. How long will you let this battle rage? Two days already passed. The third is thine. I see. For thee I have ordained it, and thus far have suffered that the glory may be thine of ending this great war, since none but thou can end it. Whatever you ask of me, father, it is done. Go then, thou mightiest in thy father's might. Ascend my chariot. Guide the rapid wheels that make heaven's basis. Bring forth all my war. My bow and thunder, my almighty arms gird on, and sword upon thy puissant thigh. Pursue these sons of darkness, drive them out from all heaven's bounds into the utter deep. There let them learn, as likes them, to despise God and Messiah, his anointed king. And on his son with rays direct shone full. He, all his father full expressed, ineffably into his face, received. And thus the filial godhead, answering, spoke. Scepter and power, thy giving I assume, and gladly I shall resign when, in the end, thou shalt be all in all, and I in thee forever, and in me all whom thou lovest. But whom thou hatest, I hate and can put on thy terrors as I put thy mildness on, image of thee in all things, and shall soon, armed with thy might, rid heaven of these rebelled, to their prepared ill mansion driven down to chains of darkness and undying worm that from thy just obedience could revolt, whom to obey is happiness entire. The third sacred morn began to shine, dawning through heaven. Forth rushed with whirlwind sound the chariot of paternal deity. Flashing thick flames, wheel within wheel undrawn, itself instinct with spirit but convoyed by four cherubic shapes. Four faces each had wondrous, as with stars their bodies all, and wings were set with eyes, with eyes the wheels of beryl and careering fires between. I should have given all to see that sight, the Son of God in glory and in might. And not alone. Attended with 10,000, thousand saints, he onward came. Far off his coming shone, and 20,000, I their number heard, chariots of God. Half on each hand were seen. Full soon among them he arrived, in his right hand, grasping 10,000 thunders which he sent before him, such as in their souls in fixed plagues. They astonished all, resistance lost, all courage. Down their idle weapons dropped, o'er shields and helms and helms' heads he rode, of thrones and mighty seraphim prostrate, that wished the mountains now might be again thrown on them as a shelter from his ire. Yet half his strength he put not forth, but checked his thunder in mid volley for he meant not to destroy but root them out of heaven. The overthrown he raised, and as a herd of goats or timorous flock together thronged, drove them before him, thunderstruck, pursued with terrors, and with furies to the bounds and crystal wall of heaven, which opening wide rolled inward, and a spacious gap disclosed into the wasteful deep. The monstrous sight struck them with horror backward, but far worse urged them behind. Headlong themselves they threw down from the verge of heaven. Eternal wrath burned after them to the bottomless pit. Nine days they fell, you say? Nine days they fell. Confounded chaos roared. That is a long, long fall. Mm. Hell, at last, yawning, received them whole, and on them closed. 
Hell their fit habitation, fraught with fire, unquenchable, the house of woe and pain. Is that it for today? You look so tired, my love. Raphael has warnings for our ancient parents still. Of Satan, he who envies now thy state, who now is plotting how he may seduce thee also from obedience. May God protect us. That with him, bereaved of happiness, thou mayst partake his punishment. Eternal misery, which would be all his solace and revenge. But listen not to his temptations. John, John, my hand can barely carry ink across the page, and you look fit to drop. Has your muse no mercy? If I leave Raphael's warning to our parents half told, then tomorrow morning it will all be lost. Please, my dear, a little more. And so, blaming his muse, the pitiless, blind poet drags his tired wife's eyes across the page, line after line, spelling out the detail of each cosmic battle, every heavenly discourse. Then after my ignominious fall, on which he lavished loving detail, he sets out on Raphael's lips the entire creation of the earth, coming to a head in the rank, weak, blank-minded creature named as... Adam? Thee, O oh man, dust of the ground, and in thy nostrils breathe the breath of life. In his own image he created thee, in the image of God express, and thou becamest a living soul. Male he created thee, but thy consort female for race. Then blessed mankind... We are so richly blessed. <laughs> then blessed mankind, and said, Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth, subdue it, and throughout dominion hold over fish of the sea and fowl of the air and every living thing that moves on the earth. Wherever thus created, for no place is yet distinct by name, thence, as thou knowst, he brought thee into this delicious grove, this garden planted with trees of God, delectable both to behold and taste. Please, sir, eat as much as you desire. Hmm. We gathered it for you. And freely all their pleasant fruit for food gave thee all sorts are here, that all earth yields variety without end. But of the tree which tasted works knowledge of good and evil, thou mayst not. In the day thou eatst, thou diest. Death is the penalty imposed. Beware, and govern well thy appetite, lest sin surprise thee, and her black attendant, death. So saying, he arose, whom Adam thus followed with benediction. Since depart, go, heavenly guest, ethereal messenger, sent from those sovereign goodness I adore. Gentle to us, and affable hath been thy condescension, and shall be honoured ever with grateful memory. Thou to mankind be good and friendly still, and oft return. So parted they, the angel up to heaven, from the thick shade, our parents to their bower. And Elizabeth to her bower, broken by devotion to her husband's muse. Your reward will come in heaven, my dear. I should be grateful for some respite while I'm here. Half yet remains unsung. Then it must wait. The night brings terrors, God's work unraveling in sleep. <laughs> our parents are in peril. Good night. O oh, foul descent, that I, who erst contended with gods to sit the highest, am now constrained into a beast, and mixed with bestial slime, this essence to incarnate an imbrute that to the height of deity aspired. But what will not ambition and revenge descend to? Who aspires must down as low as high he soared, obnoxious first or last to basest things. Revenge, at first though sweet, bitter ere long back on itself recoils. Let it, I reck not, so it light well aimed, since higher I fall short on him who next provokes my envy, this new favourite of heaven, this man of clay, son of despite, whom us the more to spite, his maker raised from dust. Spite, then, with spite, is best repaid. John! John! 
<laughs> Deep breaths. Deep drops. John? Yes? And again? May the good Lord protect us. He was screaming like a vixen, John. The night fears were upon you. It delivered us from evil. It's morning, John. The night is over. The night brings terrors. God's work unraveling in sleep. There is no point in dwelling on it. We must work. I have more lines to dictate. Perhaps a day without the burden of verse would be a blessing. Our parents are in peril. Poor fools. Milton was played by Ian McKellen, Elizabeth by Francis Barber, and Satan was Simon Russell Beale. Adam was Ashley Margolis, and Eve, Emily Peton. God was played by Russell Dixon, and Christ by David Seddon. Beelzebub was Jonathan Keeble, and Conrad Nelson, Raphael. Part one of Paradise Lost by John Milton was dramatized for radio by Michael Simmons Roberts and produced in Salford by Susan Roberts. <laughs>